Good evening and welcome. It's lovely to see you all. I understand there's a bit of traffic out there. Uh, we may have a few people joining us a little later, but by the, well, I think they'll be here by the time we get through our introductions. My name is Eric Siegel. I'm Director of Education here at the HARN. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of our director, Leanne, Dr. Leanne Chesterfield. Um, it's great to have you. Tonight's lecture is presented under the auspices of the HARN Eminent Scholar Chair in Art History. You'll see that up on the screen. HESCA, we call it. Uh, which is a wonderful series that brings together the School of Art and Art History and the Harn Museum of Art to bring uh, really remarkable and eminent scholars, critics, museum professionals, uh, art writers to the University of Florida to enhance our experience as an academic institution and as a community. Um, we're delighted to work together with the School of Art and Art History in collaboration and that tonight's lecture is going to really continue and extend that relationship. I'd like to invite to the podium uh, Dr. Tung Yun Yin, our curator of Asian art, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yun. I need to stand look over your shoulder. Oh, sure. <laughs> so thank you very much, Eric. Um, I'll just get this out, oh, okay. get out of the way. Good to go. That right. was beautiful. Okay, perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for all for taking time to join us tonight. Uh, so, I'm Tong Yun Yin, curator uh, of Asian art at the Har Museum. Uh, it is my great honor to welcome you all to um, tonight's Hasker talk. So, we were, as you might have known, we were unfortunately forced to cancel this talk in last November because of the tropical storm. Um, um, I'm very grateful for the support of the Haska Committee and for the flexibility of Dr. Uh, Professor Julia Andrews to make it happen tonight. Um, um, so, uh, Professor Andrews um, will be here with us tonight to have this very important conversation on Chinese women artists and their art practice. So this is also a topic that is related to our exhibition, She, Her, Hers, Women in the Arts of China. If you haven't got a chance to see the show, please um, come back to um, see the exhibition. So first, I would like to extend a special welcome to our guest speaker, uh, Professor Julia Andrews the Distinguished University Professor in the Department of Art History at the Ohio State University. Professor Andrews is a renowned scholar in the field of Chinese painting and modern and contemporary Chinese art. She received her master's degree at Harvard University and her doctoral degree at University of California, Berkeley, and was uh, the postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan from 1989 to 1990. Professor uh, Julia Andrews is the first American art historian to conduct uh, groundbreaking research on modern Chinese art in People's Republic of China. She has published numerous articles, books, and exhibition catalogs, including the award-winning book, Painters and Politics in the People's Republic of China from 1949 to 1979. So this book won the Joseph Levinson Prize of the Association for Asian Studies for its greatest contribution to increasing understanding of art and politics in uh, PRC. So another book um, she co-authored with Professor Kuiishan. He's also here tonight and will be giving a talk tomorrow night. So that book, Art of Modern China, won the Biennial uh, Humanities Book Prize of the International Convention of Asian Scholars in 2013. Uh, in addition to her trailblazing research on modern and contemporary Chinese art, Professor Andrews is also a highly regarded curator. She curated some very influential exhibitions, including one of the first American exhibitions of uh, chi uh, contemporary Chinese art, Fragmented Memory, the Chinese Avant-Garde in Exile, another exhibition, A Century in Crisis, Modernity and Tradition in the Art of 20th Century China was, how, was held at the Guggenheim Museum in New York City and Bilbo in 1998. So that exhibition was the first one outside China that tells a comprehensive story of modern Chinese art. 
Her more recent exhibition includes Light Before Dawn, an official Chinese art um, from 1974 to 1985. Uh, Professor Andrews has received numerous rewards and recognitions for her academic and curatorial achievements, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Fulbright Cross Strait Senior Research Fellowship, and Distinguished Scholar Award at Ohio State University. So tonight, Professor Andrews will be giving a talk entitled Women Artists in 20th Century China, a prehistory of contemporary. So please join me to welcome Professor Andrews to the podium. Uh, th th thank you, Tong Yun, for that, that really nice introduction. Um, okay, are we getting feedback on the sound? Okay, it's okay. <clears throat> So and thank all of you for coming and uh, thank you for the the, the introduction or, or, and for the invitation. But one of the best known slogans of the Mao period in China was that women can hold up half the sky, expressing a widely held belief in women's potential held by progressive citizens and educators at mid-century. It leaves artfully ambiguous the question of what kinds of responsibility women might take as they shoulder this cosmic burden. Today, I'd like to reflect on two intersecting themes, the rise of women as artists and as female subjects for art. In the context of the evolving status of their gender in China, both themes should be set against the birth of modern women's art education and the emergence of feminism, and thus are, like the art world itself, primarily urban phenomena. The first decades of the 20th century, during which all aspects of traditional social and political thought in China were reevaluated in response to multiple immediate crises, were a crucial period in her move toward modernization, formulating ideals and ideologies that have continued to reverberate throughout the nation. The benefits of female agency in culture and society were among the issues argued and promoted in the mass media of the time that retained lasting ideological power. Although there was no absence of debate about changing social rules, the periodical press of the early Republican period suggests growing support for the education of women, as well as strong advocacy in educational circles for their professional development. Economic and political issues important in Western women's movements, such as family planning and women's suffrage, were debated and discussed in relationship to China's specific conditions, as were more subjective questions of the meaning of love, marriage, and friendship. Accounts from China's first, from China's most modern metropolis, Shanghai, provide examples of formal art education for girls in the opening years of the 20th century. In 1902, Yang Bomin son of a wealthy merchant who had prospered in the treaty port city, traveled to Japan to study modern pedagogy. On his return, he and his wife opened one of the earliest and most successful girls' schools to be run entirely by Chinese educators. They were also the earliest known to have established an art department in a modern school. The Youngs housed the East City Girls' School in their spacious residence in the old city and recruited like-minded reformers and revolutionaries as instructors. Changdong School, as the English language writings of the time call it, was soon recognized both domestically and abroad. It appears in the Chinese press as early as 1904. In her 1911 book, Education of Women in, Modern, in, in China, Margaret Burton listed the Changdong School, established by Mr. and Mrs. Yang, as one of a dozen schools in Shanghai founded by Chinese educators. A 1919 Columbia Teachers College study similarly records it as one that exemplified the modern movement in women's education. School principal Yang Bomin, the father of six daughters, stressed female self-confidence and self-sufficiency. From the authoritative painting history, Haishang Molin, we learn of Yang Bomin's three-decade devotion to modern style teaching for girls and of his commitment to new forms of knowledge. 
The school offered lodging to out-of-towners and accepted female students of all ages. Essayist Zhang Yimei describes a student body ranging from old ladies in their 40s to little girls of 12 or 13, all taught by prominent intellectuals and artists. Family members of the school's faculty, daughters, sisters, and wives alike were among the students in this transitional era. The artistically inclined daughters of the Yang family, most notably Yang Chui Yao and Yang Chui Zhou, graduated from the school in, in the 1910s. They and fellow graduates would, in 1934, go on to found the Chinese Women's Calligraphy and Painting Society. Yang Bomin was close to many reformist educators and publishers, including newspaper owner and art collector Di Baoxian, who published the Eastern Times and its supplement seen here, Women's Eastern Times. Li Shutong, one of the first Chinese to graduate from the Tokyo School of Fine Arts, served as instructor and academic advisor to the school beginning in 1915. Around 1913, Li Shutong introduced life drawing and plein air painting to his students in Hangzhou. Life drawing appears soon after at Chongdong School as well. Other subjects taught in 1915, the year that Yang Chui Yao and nine other girls graduated, included Chinese language and literature, music, painting, and handicrafts, along with foreign languages, physical education, and public speaking. The 1916 graduation ceremony demonstrated the accomplishments of the students through an exhibition, choral music performance, a speech contest, instrumental recitals, a calligraphy competition, and the novel art form of the cartoon, or manhua. Li Shutong and calligrapher Yu Ren judged the manhua and calligraphy contests, respectively. The girls were trained in public, that, that girls were trained in public speaking suggests expanding expectations for their social roles, stated as writing injustice, promoting education, supporting family and nation, diligence and frugality. Yang Bomin's passion for traditional Chinese painting, a subject he included in the school curriculum, was somewhat unusual for a modern educator. He had learned painting from his famous grandfather, Zhu Cheng, and had some reputation himself as a painter of bamboo and orchids. When Yang died suddenly at the age of 50 in 1924, his daughter, Xue Zhou, took over as principal of the school. Along with new style education, <clears throat> such as that offered by Yang Bo Min and his colleagues, the early 20th century saw the appearance of mass media aimed at appealing to and guiding urban Chinese citizens in reformulating the role of women and girls in society. When China's most modern publisher, the commercial press, <clears throat> began publishing Ladies' Journal in 1915, it used as color, cover designs a series of 12 images that featured young women engaged in various activities of daily life. <clears throat> These covers were by Xu Yongqing, a commercial artist who had been trained at the Jesuit Boys' Orphanage in Xu Jiahui, outside Shanghai. These, the first issue of the ladies' uh, journal announces itself to its potential readers with a girl reading in an urban garden, emphasizing the role of women as consumers of the new mass media. The cover of issue two is set in a Western style interior with an electric light overhead and an ornate clock on the wall. Here the publisher affirms female artistic creativity as a fashionably dressed young woman, brush in hand, gazes thoughtfully down at the partially completed painting tacked to her tilted drafting board. Surrounded by various tools and supplies, <clears throat> including a square and a painting manual, she is one of the first images of a woman painting in the Western manner. Among the stated goals of the editors of Ladies Journal were to promote women's art, to facilitate understanding of Western culture, to investigate the status of women's schools, and to demonstrate the varied occupation of women. The many images of women artists published on its pages include one depicting the young calligrapher Feng Wenpeng, also known as Flora Feng, on the site of a charitable exhibition she organized in 1918 to sell her calligraphy. In the same year, 
The Ladies' Journal devoted every cover to a different painting by the 65-year-old female ink painter Wu Shujuan, both confirming her professional attainments and offering a model career for readers. The privately run Shanghai Art College, always keen to pick up the latest trend, published Wu Shujuan's likeness in the first issue of the school journal in 1919, at around the time they introduced co-educational instruction. Ink painting remained a vibrant part of the Shanghai art market, despite growing interest in Western forms of art. That her name appeared often in the press suggests an improving position for women artists in the new art world and in the celebrity culture of the first quarter of the 20th century. The 1920s began to see the emergence of female artists trained in the new Western style education. Among them is Guan Zilan, a graduate of the China Art College, where she studied with Chinese trained oil painters, I'm sorry, with Japan trained oil painters, Chan Baoyi and Ding Yanyong. Continuing her own education in Japan in 1927, she exhibited her work there repeatedly and returned to great celebrity in Shanghai in 1930. Working her 1941 solo exhibition was praised for compositional power that was the match of any man, as well as for her luminous color. Equally prominent among women returned from study abroad was the French educated oil painter, Pan Yiliang, who went on to a career as an art professor. Pan and her still life painting with a skull, the conventional European theme of memento mori is presented here as though to expose her to be a daring violator of traditional Chinese taboos in the name of art. 1923, she, along with Wu Shujuan's disciple, Li Chaojun, and some male colleagues, established a prominent collaborative atelier in Shanghai, the Yiyuan, that served as a site for lessons and as the organizing institution for their exhibitions in Shanghai. Over the previous decades, these artists had been active in the Pegasus Society, which pioneered modern art exhibitionary practice in 1920s Shanghai. Interest by the popular press of the day in women of accomplishment became part of the celebrity culture of Shanghai publishing in the 1920s and 1930s and made certain women painters household names. Among the darlings of the tabloid press were poet painters Jolian Xia, who you see at left, and Lu Xiaoman at right, famed not only for their talent, but for their beauty, literary talents, and romantic appeal. Meanwhile, the female figure, or female nude, became projections of the ideals of beauty and artistic liberation for artists working in virtually all oil painting styles of the day male and female alike. <clears throat> in contrast to this celebratory exploration of the female body, however, among Shanghai leftists, women as the victim of injustice were often vehicles for social criticism. The Ministry of Education's first national art exhibition opened in 1929 to great fanfare. Although the proportion of women artists was still relatively small, 13 of the 192 ink paintings were identified as by women, and female names are recognizable among the oil painters. The proportion is still higher than in a catalog published 45 years later during the cultural revolutionary era of state mandated feminism. The Ladies' Journal published a substantial special issue about the 1929 show. By 1934, a group of women artists, including Li Chaojun and Yang Xuezhong, Yang <clears throat> most of them veterans of the 1929 exhibition, had established the Women's Calligraphy and Painting Society, which held exhibitions once or twice a year and published its members' work. Some of these women went on to prominence in subsequent decades, with several of them appointed to the prestigious Shanghai Chinese Painting Institute in the late 1950s. This generation found support in female-only groups but also flourished in the larger art world of the day. In the cities, the foundations for a future of sustained female participation in the mainstream art world were firmly in place by the outbreak of the eight-year Sino-Japanese War in 1937, the period when a draft constitution promising female suffrage was circulated. 
Pre-war examples of self-portraits suggest that the genre was not limited to male artists. One created on the eve of the war in 1937 by painter, cartoonist, and activist Yu Feng is far more fierce than those of most male contemporaries, perhaps a character trait that sustained a lifetime career. Another painted in Paris at the war's end by the weary Pan Yunyang conveys a sense of resignation. Women who lived in Treaty Port Shanghai, like Guan Zilan or Li Chojun, continued to exhibit until the Pacific War broke out, sometimes as fun fundraisers for the Chinese troops. The Chinese Women's Calligraphy and Painting Society exhibited in Shanghai until the Treaty Port fell to the Japanese at the end of 1941, and a few of its members were in benefit exhibitions even after that. Artists who fled their homes to escape the invading army, however, or who were refugees from the destruction the bombings had caused, had a much more difficult time, and few of their paintings have yet surfaced. We know of talented artists like the European-educated Tsai Wei Lin, who died, and others who struggled to attend to their families in the harsh conditions of refugee life, like the Japanese-educated Cho Ti. A celebrated member of the avant-garde storm society in 1930s Shanghai, Cho Ti's pioneering career as an avant-garde painter was interrupted by the necessities of wartime, family life, wartime family life. One of her wartime projects was to sell handmade dolls, which also served as subject matter for the artist herself and for her male colleague, Chang Shu Hong, whose daughter, Shana, a portrait of whom you see it right, received one from Cho Ti as a gift. In ill health after the war, Cho Ti was never able to fully resume her artistic career and died of a heart attack during the anti-Ritis campaign. As painted by male artists, women in wartime served as images of tragedy. On which gender do the burdens of existential hardship weigh most heavily? That's one of the questions to be asked as research on art of the Sino-Japanese war period proceeds. Near the end of the war, <clears throat> Yu Feng exhibited with 12 men of modernist inclination. A very small number of female artists emerged from the Yan'an communist base, women who had formed the bureaucratic and pedagogical elite after 1949. Female art student Zhang Xiaofei joined the Red Army in Yan'an and there made instructional illustrations on themes essential to women and families, such as public health, sanitation, and midwifery. After 1948, she was one of the few women at the heart of the powerful new arts administration of the People's Republic of China. Whether prosperous Shanghai ladies or female revolutionaries at Yan'an, a critical mass of women advocated for social progress that would move women and families forward in the mid 20th century. Mao Zedong's Yan'an talks of 1942 which stipulated that artists must adopt the viewpoint of the workers, peasants, and soldiers, led to a dramatic, even radical, state-mandated change in the practice of art in the communist base area. Styles believed to be most legible to rural peasants replaced the urban aesthetic vocabulary of the Shanghai revolutionaries. After the communist victory in 1949, forms of art that had flourished in the 1930s and 1940s including various forms of cosmopolitan oil painting, ranging from post-impressionism to surrealism, were banned as bourgeois, while the practice of ink painting, despite its significant innovations in this period, was generally condemned as elitist, feudal, and out of touch with China's needs and realities. To accomplish the aim of remolding art and the art world, artists who could be retrained were retrained, while those who could not were retired or redirected often as art decorators or middle school teachers. At the same time, a younger generation was trained, creating a new art world to replace the old. <clears throat> Women like Guan Zilan, who became a school teacher, were left behind. A few women emerged in this new revolutionary period. One of the most successful in winning the trust of the party art establishment was Deng Shu, a peasant girl from Hebei who joined the Communist Party at the age of 17. Her early work, learning to read, 
depicts a literacy class in which children and newly liberated female peasants study side by side. In 1949, the artist went to work at the Central Academy of Fine Arts. She won a first prize in the Ministry of Cultural Awards for New Year's pictures in 1952 with the image at right of newly literate peasants signing a peace petition during the Korean War. The other first prize was awarded to a male artist, Lin Gang, who depicted Zhao Guilan, a female model worker, at her audience with Chairman Mao. Deng Shu and Lin Gang were then awarded prestigious scholarships to study in Leningrad, or now St. Petersburg, at the Repin Art Institute. Proving that ink painting could serve the party, Zhang Yan transformed the outline and color technique to depict subject matter suitable to the PRC's new social policies, a peasant woman learning to read. Zhang's rising reputation was tragically ended in a fatal plane crash in 1958. Sorry. Despite, despite great care taken in the first years of the PRC, the women artists were represented in exhibitions. What is striking when we survey the art world of the entire Mao period from 1949 to 1979 is that the social changes one might have expected to see in New China did not in the end expand the art world to a more fully egalitarian participation by women. Indeed, based upon the now well-established canon of socialist realist works produced in this period, one must argue that it instead contracted it. Documenting absence is always a tricky business, but a few statistics confirm this general impression. The rather small administrative structure for the National All-China Art Workers Association, established in July 1949, included no female members on the standing committee, or as far as I can find, on any major administrative committee. Its umbrella organization, the Federation of Literature and Art Circles, had only one, the novelist Dingling. With a major expansion of arts administrators in 1960, the Chinese Artists Association added five female artists to its list of 112, still fewer than 5%. The Cultural Revolution was clearly a step backward. In 1979, women comprised only five of 182 directors, or less than 3%. Of the five, two were among the 43 standing committee members, still less than 5%. Painters who grew up in the Republican era but graduated from the elite Central Academy of Fine Arts in the early years of the People's Republic would form the strongest cohort of women artists of the Mao period. Most were admitted to the former Beiping Art Academy before the communist victory in 1949. All completed graduate training in painting and became well-respected teachers but none received the prestigious official commissions enjoyed by their male classmates, including their husbands, all of whom were artists as well. Zhao Yoping, Beijing born of Manchurian ancestry, graduated in 1953. She earned a graduate degree in 1955 and then taught at the academy for 40 years. Although well regarded by her colleagues and students, she received few of the prestigious state commissions enjoyed by many of her male classmates the key to a reputation in the Chinese art world of the time. A slightly younger Pang Tao, born in Shanghai to the modernist painters Chou Ti and Pang Xunqin, inclined to a more lyrical style and similarly carried the classroom burden for the academy after her graduation in 1955. Zhang Ziyi, a native of Nanjing, similarly earned two degrees in painting at the Central Academy of Fine Arts. And in 1955, oops, sorry, uh, was assigned a <clears throat> provincial job in the Masses Arts Center in Xi'an. Only after the Cultural Revolution did she become a professor at the prestigious Zhejiang Academy of Fine Arts. Her career was set back by the political troubles of her husband, Tsai Liang, who had the bad fortune to be targeted in the anti hufeng campaign of 1955. Women as subjects remain common in the works of male artists, women as models of heroism, as model collective farmers, as model minorities, as future female members of the intelligentsia, as the driving force between rural communization. Despite such pictorial idealization, 
the elite group of about 20 students chosen in 1955 to participate in a two-year oil painting class taught by the Soviet expert Konstantin Maximov included no women except the translator. The only female member of the class was reportedly dismissed on grounds of poor attendance at the Academy's mandatory class on revolutionary politics. To my knowledge, of the dozen or more students sent to learn painting in Soviet bloc countries and who thereafter comprised the elite of China's official art world, only Deng Shu was female. Of the next generation, the first cohort of Central Academy graduates admitted after 1949, the oil painter Wambao achieved some recognition for her skill in rendering female subjects and was hired as a teacher at the school. Painted in the wake of the catastrophic Great Leap Forward, her most famous work is an upbeat picture of well-fed peasant girls, a happy image with which to forget the recent famine. The compelling feminist slogan with which we began, that women can hold up half the sky, circulated widely domestically and internationally during the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976. In its propagandistic context, this rhetoric carried the utopian assumption that the equality of men and women in the workforce and the family had already been achieved. Girls wore the same plain baggy clothes as boys, creating an endogenous image of China's revolutionary workforce. Yet it is in this era, the period when China's baby boomers reached maturity, that the divergence between image and actuality seems greatest. A Red Car Guard cartoon by the woman artist Wang Wulan that documents the purge of China's political elite in the early Cultural Revolution period found only two women worthy of caricature, Wang Guangmei, you see it left, and Yan Weibing, the wives of politicians Liu Xiaoqi and Lu Dingyi. Seizing on tropes of vanity and jealousy, the artist marks Wang for wearing pearls and high heels to a diplomatic function, and Yan for penning anonymous denunciations of a woman she envied. Despite rhetoric to the contrary, the scarcity of women artists and their relatively subordinate positions proved to be the rule rather than the exception. Beginning in 1968, urban girls were sent along with boys to labor in China's remote border areas. During the reign of fear that brought normal social relations to a halt, art almost ceased as most artists, old and young, male and female, were forced to do labor of other kinds. In 1972, however, following exposure of the alleged treason of Mao's chosen successor, Lin Biao, some of the most symbolic of governmental functions, including art exhibitions, were revived. The 1972 National Art Exhibition and the second in 1974 solicited artworks from workers, peasants, and soldiers, including rusticated urban youth. To guarantee the quality of the exhibition, despite the desired non-professional status of its artists, organizers recruited an elite team of painting correction professionals to Beijing for the purpose of retouching any exhibits declared by the political leadership to have aesthetic or ideological flaws. Even as propagandists disseminated China's feminist slogans worldwide, none of the high profile young oil painters selected for this task was female. And only one worked in the Chinese painting correction group. The illustrated handbook of the subsequent show in 1974 published only six works by female artists, including an oil by Chang Li. And the canonical works of the Cultural Revolution period thus are mainly by, by men. The aesthetic program of China's cultural leader of the time, Mao Zedong's wife, Zhang Qing, guided the thematic and stylistic requirements of this exhibition art. Mao's themes with workers, peasants, or soldiers as subject, the main theme, the main figure depicted heroically, the main character illuminated theatrically, Given Zhang Qing's avowed feminism, these heroic subjects were often preferred to be female and are usually highly dramatized. Pan Jun's I Am Petrol, for example, renders a ruddy-faced young woman suspended 
high atop a telephone pole in the midst of a raging storm. Undaunted by wind or rain, she perilously tests the transmission by quoting Maxim Gorky's revolutionary poem, Song of the Stormy Petrel. Six years after Mao initiated the Russification movement, as its negative aspects became more widely known, the leadership tried to reorient public opinion by celebrating its alleged success with images of barefoot doctors, coal miners, and young women inspired by the actresses in Jiang Qing's model performances. Representing the peasantry in these exhibitions were many rusticated urban youth, teenagers from the cities who were sent for re-education by rural labor. The Beidahuang printmakers who worked near the Siberian border were such young people, selected for artistic talent and transferred temporarily from farm labor to instead rebuild the nation's cultural infrastructure. A well-received multi-block woodcut welcoming spring was one of the was by one of the rare female participants, Wang Lan, who was sent from Beijing to Heilongjiang at the age of 16. She here represents an idealized winter scene of the military farm on which she worked. During the months when it's too snowy and cold for outdoor labor, a girl carefully tends the sprouts that would be planted after the last frost. This lyrical image of a woman by a woman managed to satisfy both the formal and thematic requirements of the era. Wang Lan later became a college professor in Shenyang before immigrating to Australia in 1991. Given the intense focus on women's empowerment in this era and its vivid projection in 1970s image of cultural revolutionary China, one has to wonder why only these few women were brought into public view. Why have so few women made it into the lasting canon of modern Chinese art? At the end of the Cultural Revolution, even the unofficial art groups that emerged in 1979, like the Stars or the Xingxing Group in Beijing, were male activities. One single girl, Li Shuang, was recruited to join the Stars, a group associated with the Democracy Wall Movement in 1979. She later served a prison term for her love affair with a French diplomat. And then, like most of her fellow artists in the group, moved abroad. A remarkable exception was the group of girls and boys who banded together during the last years of the Cultural Revolution to paint apolitical landscapes. A small painting by one of the women artists, Zheng Ziyan, depicts the view from the apartment where they often illicitly gathered. They emerged as an officially sponsored exhibition in the summer of 1979, taking the group Wu Ming, or No Name, and, thus thera and thereafter vanished from the art world for decades. Unusual for their time, about half the loosely affiliated participants were women. With the reestablishment of more normal cultural, civic, and governmental institutions after the Cultural Revolution, the art ed educational system was also revived and soon reassumed its dominant position in the art world. The nurturing of female talent within China's art academies was thus a precondition of women assuming significant roles as professional artists. When I first lived in Beijing in 1980 at the Central Academy of Fine Arts, a key art school in China, the entire enrollment of girls was housed at one end of a single dormitory corridor which had been sectioned off from the rest of the male students by adding a wall to block the hall. Although the overall college enrollment was not large, female students were extremely few. None were admitted to the most prestigious graduate program, oil painting, in the first, first cohort after the Cultural Revolution. It was only the new and less well-established programs that might take a chance on a young woman. The graduate mural painting department accepted one who made a significant career abroad, uh, Liu Hong. The undergraduate programs in oil painting and printmaking each enrolled two. Ten others were concentrated in the ink painting major. On graduation, however, most were assigned to administrative jobs. The small number of female students contrasts with the relatively gender balanced art school enrollments achieved during the Nanjing decade of the Republican period between 1927 and 1937. At China's second key art college, the Zhejiang Academy of Fine Arts, 
the situation was only slightly better. Although the few female students made some mark, there were simply not very many of them. Wang Gong Yi, a 1980 graduate of the graduate program in printmaking, was hired as a professor there, and then eventually moved to the United States. The Shanghai-born artist Shi Hui entered the academy in the first class to be selected by competitive examination after the Cultural Revolution. She was hired as an instructor after graduating in applied arts in 1982, and between 1986 and 1989, worked closely with the Bulgarian textile artist Marin Varbanov in his postgraduate workshop to develop modernist fiber art in China. Her career has flourished in recent years as China's art world has become more international. Chen Haiyan, a printmaker who graduated in 1984, was also hired by the academy to teach. Quietly pursuing her exploration of the subconscious in a diary-like series of dream images, she has continued to attract attention at home and abroad for her powerfully expressive work. The graduating class of 1985 in oil painting had only one young woman, Wang Lihua. She was chosen for a workshop offered by a visiting professor from Paris, Zhao Gi, in 1985 as the sole female student. She taught at the Shanghai Drama Academy uh, before moving to the US, where she found her voice as an installation artist. Despite this handful of success stories, women art students in the 1980s were still extremely few. And as this generation matured, the art world naturally became even more male dominated. As it turned out, Zhejiang graduates and young faculty members would play a crucial role in the so-called 85 New Wave movement, an exhilarating and well-publicized effort to overthrow the stale socialist realist art of the old establishment. The New Wave crested with the 89 China avant-garde exhibition in Beijing, which was unfortunately followed by a three-year cultural freeze in the wake of the June 4th massacre. When China reopened in 1993, Young graduates of the Zhejiang Academy, like Wang Guangyi and Zhang Peili, emerged to lead contemporary Chinese art in a direction that could speak to international audiences. Given the few girl students at the school, it's no surprise that women were scarce in this historic movement, that they remain relatively few in what developed into a new artistic elite with its roots in the 1980s. One quiet exception is Chan Haiyan, who has steadily exhibited in domestic print exhibitions since the 1980s. A small group of women graduated from the Central Academy of Fine Arts in 1988, and in 1989 and 1990, they held exhibitions together as women artists. Of them, Yu Hong has persisted with the most sustained exhibition program and most vividly paints from a female perspective. Appointed to the Central Academy of Fine Arts faculty in, at age 22. She exhibited twice at the Venice Biennale in the 1990s and went on to earn a master's degree from the school in 1996. Yuhong's painting, steeped in social commentary, often has an autobiographical strain and a disconcerting, almost clinical observation of the contemporary Chinese society in which she lives. Her Ladder to the Sky similarly exemplifies the urban social concerns of her generation. Our puzzlement at what initially seems like surrealism turns to dismay as we realize that she's de depicted an array of Beijing people, old and young, male and female, as they struggle up a heavenly ladder of social progress, none ever arriving, but some losing their footing and plunging off the ladder as though falling to hell. Each person approaches the challenge with a different attitude, from stubborn rejection to excessive eagerness. As our eyes descend from this parable-like figurative composition, we find our concern for their peril echoed in the posture of a little girl on the ladder's lowest ring at left, a representative of the new generation who has been born into the contemporary dog-eat-dog -dog society. Many of the characters in this drama are based on likenesses of people the artist knows. Her daughter, now grown, for example, is represented at the upper right. 
Yu Hong herself was a child during the Cultural Revolution. The society into which she was born was one supported by a utopian ideology of communal revolution. And much of her work has probed the unmoored state of the individual, often characterized in autobiographical terms as an urban woman, when those communal goals were shattered in the post-Mao era. The China of her daughter's future, however, is one apparently stripped of all traces of this commutarian past, leaving each individual to be pushed forward, like it or not, by new economic and social pressures. Trained in the techniques of socialist realism, its ideals were dead by the time Yu Hong graduated, and we may term her approach post-socialist realist. Her work has always concentrated on the private rather than the public, preferring to use painting as a question rather than as an answer. She is one of a growing but still comparatively small number of women painters in her generation to establish a sustained career over these past three decades. Coming from a very different starting point is the somewhat younger Sichuanese ink painter and conceptual artist Peng Wei, who also lives in Beijing. The daughter of an ink painter, she received her formal artistic education at Nankai University in Tianjin. Her work often refers in general terms to antique masterpieces, but she objectifies them in ways that make evident the vast gulf between the modern painter and the masters of the art historical canon. And she puts anachronistic female figures on her stage. Rather than valorizing the accomplishments of a specific artist or work of art, as a traditionalist painter might do, the past seems to be an undifferentiated source of equally weighted visual ideas. She creates trompe l'oeil albums, hanging scrolls or hand scrolls, by painting in polychromatic watercolor on both sides of her rough handmade paper, rendering with great care every part of the object, including both the image of a painting and the elaborate silk textile borders that would ornament its mounting. At first, first glance of virtuoso technical performance, Peng Wei's gorgeous postmodern emulation of pre-modern mounting practices might be a challenge to the venerable Chinese artistic tradition. By claiming its superficial trappings as her own, she easily injects herself into the canon without the mediation of critic, historian, collector, or even mounting master, and by implication, questions, or even casts aside the entire millennium-long art historical apparatus. Scrutiny of the long colophons that she juxtaposes with her seemingly classicizing paintings makes this abundantly clear. Rather than predictable transcriptions of Chinese poetry, they're normally passages from books she is reading, which are usually translated texts of European philosophy, biography, or literature. A series of silken shoes in which she has painted half-hidden erotic images in a Ming style raise other kinds of questions about the female perspective as do her mannequin installations. It's encouraging that the expansion of China's economy and greater freedom of travel, at least before COVID-19, gave artists new venues for exhibiting and new ways of engaging with the art world. Beijing artist Zhang Yanzi, stranded for a year in her daughter's New York apartment by the pandemic, responded to her ceramics, painted masks, and a dancer incarcerated by an oven rack both later shown in um, Art Basel in Hong Kong. Painters who emerged from the 1980s avant-garde have been able to establish international reputations that have now been recognized at home and have gradually broken down the boundaries of official art. Female artists being less numerous to begin with, remain far less well represented among those who've emerged internationally, but this is changing. Insistence by foreign curators inspired by feminism or egalitarianism, that exhibitions of contemporary art must include female artists, has played a role in giving them opportunity to be seen, a first step for artists of talent to establish lasting careers. Because showing abroad is usually seen as legitimation by the domestic art world, such opportunities have helped more than a few women artists enter the mainstream. Why, after a promising start, did female artists lose ground in the second half of the 20th century, 
so that a recuperation of their status has been necessary in the 21st. Although gender equality is a worldwide issue, one factor unique to China is the overwhelming ideological importance accorded after 1949 to Mao Zedong's Yan'an talks on literature and art, which explicitly aimed to bring urban intellectuals with their bothersome independence of thought down to the level of peasants who were seen, assumed to be more easily manipulated. This also opened the door for rural administrators to bring their more traditional social ideas into China's advanced urban centers. This may be a factor, along with the largely man-made catastrophes China suffered between 1957 and 1979, for the setback to women's equality that has not been completely overcome even today. Relatively recent changes have transformed the environment in which women learn and work. In 1999, for example, it was decided to radically expand the enrollments at China's elite art academies, leading to the construction of colossal new campuses. Instead of 10 or 12 students in each graduating cohort, there are now thousands, many of them women. Among this vastly larger number of aspiring artists, one assumes more will succeed. Furthermore, whatever negative effects the one-child policy, in effect from 1979 to 2016, has had, in the cities, it has produced a generation of confident only children, women who had no brothers and usually enjoyed a great deal of family support for their education and career goals. <clears throat> the increasing number of competent women occupying supporting roles, including curators, gallerists, and art educators is evident. It may be too early to tell if these and other factors will improve the reputation and careers of women artists, or increase the quality and quantity of art made by women. But hope seems justified. We are, of course, left with many questions about gender, art object, and image. Can women's continued progress in art or in society take place in China without risky social activism or explicit feminism? Do the gender positions of female artists vis-a-vis -vis the international art world make a difference? How do stereotypes of women's roles, whether held by male or female citizens, affect the art world's progress? Can a woman artist whose work has no sign of the female in subject matter or expressive style be considered feminist? Is art that expresses female concerns by an artist who rejects such labels feminist? And finally, even if the artist herself brushes off these topics, should we avoid asking such questions of her art. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I was wondering uh, when I saw the pictures that were painted, the paintings from before the the communist revolution, what, were a significant number of those destroyed by the cultural revolution? Is there a gap in the record? Um, uh, were those that we saw lucky enough to survive? Or, I wonder. Let's see. Um, s some of them uh, did survive. Uh, uh, being given, as some were given to the National Art Museum of China, and they, um, of course, didn't show this kind of art, but they did keep it in the storeroom, and and so it has now been brought out in a, uh, in the new era when it's when it's uh, becoming acceptable, um, but um, most of the work in the periodicals that I showed has has not turned up and and um, apparently does does not survive. Um, the, um, much of the destruction of this kind of work was actually um, done by artists themselves who were terrified at what would happen when the Red Guard came to their, came to their homes. Um, although some, of course, was discovered, was, was destroyed by the Red Guard, but, um, uh, but, but some did survive. Not, not certainly not enough, though, to tell. When when we look, for example, at um, at Japan, which of course 
suffered terribly in the fire bombings in World War II. Um, the, the ability to document an artist's career there with a continuous evolution of, of art is something that's unmatched in China because not only the Cultural Revolution, but um, the Japanese invasion in 1937 um, caused terrible destruction. The um, Art Academy in Hangzhou, which was the sort of hotbed of modernism in that period, was, um, was uh, everything there was destroyed um, by, the, by the Japanese. And um, then when the artists fled inland uh, during the war, um, it, it was uh, difficult to paint in, in oils in, in that period. Um, in reference to the sisters that were educated by their parents, the school, the Shandong school, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I can speak a, a little of it, yeah. After oh. 1941, can you tell us anything about the progression of their careers? Okay, the, the artists who were educated at the Chengdong uh, school, right. for the example. Right, the sisters, the right. Shuizhou and Shuiyao. Um, uh, the... They continued to run the school um, through, um, I, I, and I'm not exactly sure until when, but I think up, up until almost uh, the time of the war uh, breaking out. Um, uh, I, 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 let's see, some of the graduates became, after 1949, um, became members of the um, Shanghai Painting Institute, which, which was a, um, made them um, officially recognized professional artists in the new, new art, art establishment. Um, but they were, of course, expected to undergo thought reform and to begin painting paintings on the new socialist realist subjects. So, um, uh, but, but some of their work has survived. Um, others, though, um, essentially left the art world and um, became, um, Became teachers or, or took some other kind of. Some Is other that kind school of still in existence? No, it it um it did did not survive the um the lifetime of of the family that that, that ran it. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Hi, thank you so much for this talk. It was just, um, there's so much, so much, and uh, <laughs> that's really encouraging um, uh, and, and all new to me. So my question comes from not knowing anything about this, but um, I'm wondering about in the, the earlier period of the, the artists that you talked about who were involved with public exhibitions, um, if you have any sense about how the works were received, like you mentioned one of the artists who sort of had celebrity status, but do you have any sense about reception of these things? I mean, like, was, was it meaningful that these were works by women artists or was it more like just artists amongst artists? You know, how much was this sort of visible right. or talked about or? Great. Yeah. Well, um, our, our criticism in China in general was, was um, was a kind of new, it was a modern phenomenon. And so um, writers were kind of finding their, their way. And, um, uh, but I, I, I think one generalization you, you can certainly make is it, um, because there was a, a big push in the period um, after the Republic was established to educate women and, and to find ways to um, improve Chinese society and the economy and everything by, by involving them. Um, the, the, the mass media really um, put a lot of effort into publicizing what notable women were, were doing. And in, in some cases, they were just um, pretty faces on the cover of magazines, but um, but what they really preferred was a pretty face who was also a woman of great talent, and and so they they would um, they, they, so um, many, many women who who were involved in art exhibitions and so forth, who were um, in any way willing to cooperate with with this, um, 
they be, became celebrities and, and were published on the on the pages of, of the um, of the of tabloids and and uh, regular uh, regular magazines as as, as well. Um, but in terms of um, I, I have not found too much writing in, in that is um, very complex uh, uh, about them uh, so far. The, the women themselves in 1934, when they organized this um, uh, women's society, um, I think had the idea of, of mutually supporting one another by, by, by writing. Um, but you do begin to find even earlier than that, um, I, I mentioned this group called the, the Even that was a, it was a kind of private art school um, that was run out of the um, very large house of one of the male members of the group. But the um, the faculty who taught there were about half women, and the, um, the the theoretical writing for the group was was often written by by the women women artists. So um, so so they 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 were. Um, in, emerging in, in the in the art world in, in that period. Uh, um, yes, I, I would say so. Um, they, um, particularly among the yeah yeah among the ink painters, but some of the oil painters as as, as well. Um, one um, testimony to this is that there was. Um, af after the war, there there was um, what I think they had envisioned as a series, but actually only came out in, in one um, edition, was a, a yearbook of Chinese art that was published in 1948. And they they had um, uh, all kinds of historical sections in this, in this book, but um, one of them was a section on um, prominent painting masters and their disciples, and it, it gave a um, the name of the artist, and then it gave the names of their disciples in order of seniority within the atelier. And um, um, uh, uh, not only do women appear among the disciples, but, but there are actually some ateliers that, in, in which the uh, primary um, leader, the, the, the master of, of the atelier, is, is a, a woman, woman artist. And um, several of them were, were women who came, came out of these, these groups that was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I was learning a lot from uh, your lecture. And uh, I was graduated in the China Academy of Art in Hangzhou, you mentioned. And then uh, I just noticed that uh, um, there are so many women artists um, in the 21st century in China, and then they use their uh, the all kind of social media to promote their artwork, especially during the um, pandemic. And um, they, I think they are um, doing a very good job. Um, one of my uh, like a junior sister um, in my class, she sold over uh, one million dollars, um, like uh, art license uh, in the past year, mm -hmm. and then she is not the only uh, woman artist doing that uh, in the social media right now. So, yeah, I think it's a new phenomenon in the Chinese art market, and uh, a lot of uh, young Chinese women sell their artwork. Um, through like Chinese Facebook, uh, Instagram, and yes, uh, it's a new thing in in the art market. Yeah, that, that's a, a very um, very useful comment. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've also seen that um, many of the um, gallerists. I mean, there there, there has been a, a boom in, in new new galleries in in the twenty first century and. Um, uh, auction houses, of course, as well, and 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 um, there, um, many uh, young women uh, who are pushing uh, pushing uh, ahead in the, in those in those fields, and and that certainly um, uh, helps helps uh, artists of, of both genders. Yeah, so.
Well, thank you so much for a really wonderful talk. Uh, you've introduced us to such an amazing array of artists and uh, really uh, said some really inspiring things about them. I'd like to invite you all to join us for a reception in the Galleria um, where we can continue talking about the, the lecture and uh, have a chance to, to speak for, further with Dr. Andrews. Thank you once again. And I'll just mention we are open till nine o'clock tomorrow night when you can see the exhibition, She, Her, Hers. Such a wonderful companion experience for this lecture. <laughs>